Hello, and it's time for Chapter 6 Key Questions. So first of all, how was French settlement of the New World similar to the English? And then how was it different? Well, religion does play a role, so that's one way that it's similar. At first, Huguenots began trying to come over here. And then eventually, once uh, they really settled New France at Quebec, it becomes a Catholic headquarters uh, through which Jesuit Catholic priests would wander around with explorers trying to convert natives. So religion plays a similar part into it. Second would be the fact that it was very focused on economics. They wanted to make money just like the English did, and that's what caused most of the settlement of New France and what would now be Canada. Of course, theirs was focused more on beaver fur, not so much agriculture as it would be in the southern colonies. But that beaver fur trade brought many Frenchmen over and caused them to invest uh, more people and resources into New France than they would have otherwise. So how is it different from the English? Well, with it being primarily Catholic, that alone says there is a religious difference. But the biggest differences come in first in uh, how they handled the Native Americans, the fact that the Native Americans were more friends than they were enemies. Uh, they embraced the Native Americans. They treated them respectfully and mingled with them uh, in many different types of relationships. Uh, that is quite different from the English who saw them as how they could be used and then took their land from them and pushed them further westward. The second biggest difference between the two would also be how their governments were run. The government of New France was directly controlled by the king. It was completely autocratic with no legislative assemblies and no trial by jury. So there's your similarities and differences between the two groups. So what caused the conflict between the French and the English? Really, uh, inside of America, the conflicts were spilled over from European conflicts. War in Europe would find its way over in the Americas. As far as in America, what caused the conflict or what they actually fought about here, obviously land would be an issue, but they struggled to gain control over the fur trade. They struggled in trying to control uh, the goods uh, that could be earned and, and found inside of America. Um, those would be the main reasons for conflict. But getting into number three, what caused the most conflict and what will start the war uh, known as the French and Indian War here, Seven Years' War back in Europe, that's the conflict over the Ohio River Valley. As New France was going to expand further south and the British were looking to expand to the west, the two sides were naturally going to come into conflict over that specific area of territory. Um, George Washington is sent in there. He's sent to claim it for uh, people from Virginia. He is turned away as the French have already established control of the region. He returns the next year with a group of troops meant to establish a fort at Fort Duquesne. But since Fort Duquesne already existed, there was nothing they could do. Uh, after a quick battle and the building of Fort Necessity, Washington is sent back home uh, after some bloodshed, and that sparks war, first in the colonies, and then it spills over into Europe. So that's what causes the French and Indian War. So what's the Albany plan of union, and why is it significant? Well, first of all, let me reiterate, as I will in class, the Albany Plan of Union doesn't actually go into action. It was just an idea put forward by Benjamin Franklin. So what was it exactly? Well, the idea was that the colonies would bond together and they would join together to form kind of a shared government and they would all share taxes to help protect themselves from a future invasion. They would build forts and they would work together. So the significance of it is this was an attempt by Benjamin Franklin to unite the colonies together against uh, many of the issues that they were having, as well as some of their squabbles with each other. Why does it not go into action? Well, it doesn't go into action because the colonies thought that it would take independence away, and Britain believed that it would actually give more freedom or too much freedom to the colonies. So why is it significant? Because this shows that the colonies are reaching a point where they may be willing to work together and even unite under one large body. It, while it doesn't actually form any kind of lasting union, it at least shows you that the colonies are considering that they may need to come together and help each other in one way or another. Number five, what did Braddock's blunder reveal about the attitude of the English toward their colonists? Well, Braddock led the, the charge on Fort Duquesne, which is really the beginning of the war in, in the European mindset. And he uses old school warfare in that he marches in a large block straight towards Fort Duquesne. He refuses to use either the colonists, the colonial militia, who uh, actually knew the landscape and knew how battles were fought in America. He also refused to use any, any kind of Indian scouts to look ahead. 
Uh, combine this with the fact that the British refused to allow um, colonial militia above a specific rank in the military, as that was reserved for British regulars, and that tells you that they looked down upon the colonists. They thought that they were not true British citizens, that they weren't to be given full respect. And the fact that his blunder ends in his own death, as well as a mass defeat for the British at Fort Duquesne, tells you that their attitude would cost them. Uh, we'll see what happens in the Revolutionary War when they continue to doubt the abilities of colonial militia, uh, and we'll see how that costs him in some of the early battles. Number six, how did William Pitt lead the English to victory over the French in the Seven Years' War? Well, first of all, he fully committed to the American conflict. He believed that the Americas were the key to future success and future growth for Europe, and so he spent a lot of money in winning the war inside of America. Um, but it was his financial investment and his willingness to empty the treasury of the British government and really put them into massive debt, which leads him to victory not only in America, but around the world. Now, that has repercussions, as we'll talk about in the next few chapters, because Britain goes into massive debt to win this world war, or what many historians consider a world war, and their victory costs them because of those debts they have to raise taxes, which will cause quite a bit of conflict here in the colonies. Number seven, what caused Pontiac's Rebellion and how was Pontiac defeated? Well, Pontiac's Rebellion is caused by many of the same ideas we've talked about already, about conflict between the Indians and the English, and that there are cultural pressures. But most of all, in this case, it is the pressure of the colonists to want to expand westward across the Appalachians and take land from the Native Americans. Um, so Pontiac unites the Indians on the frontier. Once he realizes his French allies are gone and he's only left with the British colonists, he knows that there will be very little cooperation and he can see the future written on the wall for his people. So he unites all the tribes, or many tribes, west of the Appalachians to fight back and push back the British expansion. Uh, because of the destruction that he uh, carries out against the British, the British are going to come through and negotiate with him to create the proclamation line mentioned in number eight there. Now, how was Pontiac defeated? Well, technically, he wasn't defeated in the sense that it was a military conquest and, and like King Philip, he's beheaded. Uh, really, it, the war ends because they reach a peace agreement. But he's the way the British fight against Pontiac to slow his uh, progress down is he used biological warfare. You've probably heard your whole life about smallpox blankets. And in this case, this is when the British use that to poison, not poison, but uh, to... Uh, I guess, distract and to kill the population of the Indians to wear them down to where they'd be willing to negotiate. Pontiac himself is actually killed by a fellow a Native American chief, and that's because he had begun taking a positive move towards a relationship with the British because he was willing to negotiate. It was not a, uh, not a complete buy-in and, and defeating the British. Uh, he was eventually assassinated by a fellow chief. So getting on to number eight, and really why Pontiac's Rebellion is important, it's because the British draw the Proclamation Line of 1763. The purchase, or the excuse me, the purpose was to stop the colonist expansion past the Appalachians, and the purpose was really to appease the Native Americans. They did not want that warfare uh, to uh, be waged between the two sides. They wanted to keep trade and relationships intact, and so they drew that line to stop the colonist expansion. What impact did it have? Well, I mean, think about it from the perspective of a colonist. Would you like the idea of having fought a war in which cost thousands of lives and, and now your taxes are even pushed to be higher and then the Britain decides not to let you move into that territory? So the impact was that it's, it upset many colonists who outright ignored the proclamation line and expanded in and explored anyway, uh, but really it drove a wedge between both the British government and the colonists here in the Americas. So that does it for the chapter six key questions. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, shoot me a message and be sure you dislike this video.